Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to be with you uh, this afternoon. And uh, my sincere thanks to uh, all of you who have given up your lunch hour to be here. Um, since the topic is forgiveness, I hope that you will forgive me. Uh, for that. And uh, in particular, my uh, thanks to the Division for Research Development and particularly to the uh, members of the Forum Lecture Committee for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Uh, so Dr. Tehran and uh, colleague Felicia McDonald, you've been wonderful in helping me uh, to be prepared and I appreciate that uh, a great deal. Um, so as the, the topic suggests, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on uh, the impossibility of forgiveness and the, the choice of uh, that word impossibility will become clearer uh, as we go through. And in particular, what um, complexifies this notion of, of forgiveness in South Africa are these intersections of religion, race, and politics, and a number of associated areas, and we'll, we'll delve into them. So, um, just to say that uh, the, the topic of, of today's presentation comes out of um, uh, a body of research that I've been engaged in for the last four years. Um, which has just been con concluded, and a little plug, the book will be coming out uh, with Sun Media in the Bayes Media series uh, within the next couple of weeks. So I know you all can't wait to get out yes. there and buy it, so uh, please do that, it helps the Bayes Media Centre. But we're going to focus a little bit today on uh, South African Methodist political theologies. How's that for a mouthful? Um, and that'll become clearer in a moment. And the complicated relationship uh, between members of black and white religious communities in South Africa. Um, in particular, we're going to try and answer the question, is forgiveness in South Africa a possibility or an impossibility, since it's such a, a contested notion? So that's a little bit of an outline of, of what we'll cover, and if you need to leave before the end, for whatever reason, comfort, or needing to get to another session, you have it there. So I want to begin by telling you a little story of what happened in these interactions. Uh, the project that I was involved in um, worked with uh, a group of white South African Methodist Christians and black South African Methodist Christians, and in particular, we were interested to see these two communities had been separated racially, um, and we were interested to see what might each of these communities regard as the concept of forgiveness, what does forgiveness mean, and what might be uh, some of the preconditions or expectations for them to begin to talk about the possibility of forgiveness. So not forgiveness per se, but what might possibilize uh, that. And I want to share with you one little uh, instance that took place. So we worked with uh, intercultural Bible reading sessions where we brought these groups together and they read a specific biblical text. The Bible became a, a sort of reflective surface, uh, a centering power in the conversation that uh, allowed them to engage in a common task, uh, to try and figure out what might this text have to say about forgiveness and that allowed for some interaction that wasn't direct interaction. Uh, it allowed for some interaction through interpretations of the text. So it was mediated in that sense. It was a hermeneutic engagement. Some way into the, uh, the intercultural Bible reading process, an event took place where two of the male members uh, got into an argument in one of the sessions. And um, they were basically arguing about uh, reparations, uh, restorative justice, the issue of white privilege uh, and South Africa's apartheid history. And uh, the white uh, participant was saying, you know, can't we just stop talking about apartheid? I know it was wrong, uh, it was sinful, I've confessed it to God, I believe God has forgiven me and us, and we just need to move on. And all this talk about white privilege, reparation, it's, it's just nonsense. Uh, I've worked for everything that I have, and there's no way that I can uh, repay anything. And they were engaged in quite a robust discussion around that, as you can imagine. Until the black participant uh, stopped the white participant and asked him a question. And he said to him, tell me, are you a parent? To which the white participant said, yes, I am. And he said, when you think about your children's future, when you dream about their lives, what do you dream about? 
which the white participant replied something to the extent I dream that they'll be happy and healthy and safe and secure. And the black participant said, well, guess what? I have the same dream. And I think that that captures something of what we were trying to understand in this particular study. Um, how we can move beyond very entrenched positions, often where there is no willingness even to understand the other, to begin to find spaces of connection uh, around which people uh, can talk. So, why impossible forgiveness? Now, forgiveness is a theological and social discourse in South Africa. It is deeply contested. Numerous South African scholars and activists, some of them uh, in this room, have raised concerns about the transactional nature of the concept of forgiveness. In particular, there are concerns about the expectation that the concept places on persons who have been wronged. Is it morally acceptable to expect a person or community who has been harmed to forgive the other? And if there are certain instances in which this may be acceptable or desirable, what are the expectations of the perpetrators of harm? Now, what is clear is that forgiving another for wrongdoing is a complex and difficult process. And theological understandings of forgiveness vary a great deal amongst persons who hold religious beliefs, and the same can be said for Christians. And this is particularly so when persons hold different understandings of the concept based on their social identity and their current contextual reality. It will be shown as we go through uh, today's lecture that social identity shaped by notions such as race, culture, economic reality, of course theological beliefs, and current experience play a significant role in the hermeneutics of forgiveness. So hermeneutics is the science of interpretation, how people give meaning uh, to their beliefs. Moreover, interpersonal socio-political factors such as the nature of the historical offence, whether reparation has been made or attempted, the political identities of the parties involved, expectations and conditions for the self and for the other also play a role in understandings of forgiveness. And naturally, you can imagine that this is particularly contested in present-day South Africa. Now, at this point, I want to make a brief discursus on an aspect of terminology. In my writing, and whenever I have the chance to speak, I encourage colleagues not to use the phrase post-apartheid South Africa. And uh, my colleague, Jan Goethe, and I have written a little bit about this. Although political apartheid ended in South Africa when the first democratic elections took place in April 1994, the reality is that the daily experience of most South Africans, uh, in the daily experience of most South Africans, apartheid remains very present. And as we shall see, economic segregation, racial and spatial and geographic segre segregation, ongoing racism and the politics of identity seem to be worse today than they were in 1994, certainly in some qualitative senses. And so my work, particularly with young black South African activists, many who were born into freedom after 1994, has led me to the conviction that the use of the term post-apartheid South Africa is disingenuous. It compounds the suffering of those who experience the slow violence of poverty, those who are disenfranchised and cut off from political and social agency. And by using that language, it suggests that their daily experience is not valid or real. So within the South African social, political, and economic, and religious context, forgiveness of the self and the other needs to be considered. And some have suggested that forgiveness is a necessary condition for moving forward for a better future for all South Africans. And indeed, that nothing will be able to change until we are able uh, to get to a reconciled or forgiven state. However, as recent research shows, uh, we are facing some challenges in this regard. The Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, in their reconciliation barometer, uh, indicated that economic inequality is probably the largest issue that uh, stands in the way of any form of constructive engagement between the races in South Africa. The last line of that uh, quotation, most believe that it's impossible to achieve a reconciled society for as long as those who were disadvantaged under apartheid remain poor within the new South Africa. Now, recent events 
in South Africa, such as the Fees Must Fall protests against economic inequalities and economic injustice in higher education, and the spate of racial slurs and denials of black pain on social media, uh, Penny Sparrow and Mrs. Zilla being two examples of that, and the re-racialization of society through identity politics seem to support the IJR's findings. South Africa faces significant challenges when it comes to dealing with the sins of our past and the complexity of our current life. So the question is, in this reality, how do people understand forgiveness? What does it mean if you are black and South African, or if you are white and South African, to begin to engage this terminology? Is forgiveness possible or impossible? Now the use of the phrase impossible in brackets is deliberate. The notion is predicated on Derrida's use of impossible in his lecture, a certain impossible possibility of saying the event. Just the title is philosophically dense. Um, and also on Richard Carney's discussion of this concept in relation to forgiveness, that my colleague Helhart introduced me to, forgiveness as the limit, impossible or possible. And the concept is discussed in greater detail in some of my other work, but what I want to point out today is the importance in my usage of the term is the tension that the phrase creates between what is impossible and so becomes by its very nature possible. The bracketing of what makes the impossible possible. As will be shown, the impossibility of forgiveness, the fact that true forgiveness is not possible in an economic or in a practical sense, is what makes true forgiveness, certainly in a theological sense, both possible and necessary. The question is, how could one ever attach a price to compensate for the violence of apartheid? What possible act or gesture, gesture could truly account for the dehumanizing consequences of this social and political system? Now, by asking these questions, I'm not meaning to imply that they are unimportant. In fact, they are crucial and they are necessary. However, what the question does raise is the contingent relationship that some political actors place between mere political, economic and social recompense and the true nature of humanization and rehumanization in South Africa. So in this sense, we can claim that forgiveness is both a theological and a political construct. So let's move on to consider how the participants in the study conceptualize forgiveness. And we're going to discuss that under the heading of a politics of forgiveness. Now, before we discuss the findings of the project, it's worth just clarifying uh, why the term or concept or process of forgiveness was chosen when it is so contested, and why didn't my research rather focus on mercy, or retribution, or compensation, or reconciliation? These seem to be uh, fairly popular terms in, uh, in, in public discourse. Why such a deeply religious and theologically textured concept as forgiveness? Now, South Africa remains a deeply religious nation. Uh, as we shall see from the most recent uh, general household survey, uh, it's not too bad, you should be able to see that. The survey shows that 84.2% of South Africans self identify as Christians. Now, the interesting thing is that this is an increase of 4.4% from the 2001 general household survey. So the largest percentage of South Africa citizens indicate that they have some, even though nominal, relationship to the Christian faith. Um, the question is, however, not whether they have this identity, but what role does religion play in their public and political lives? In 2010, a Pew report found that 74% of South Africans indicated that religion plays, and I quote, an important role in their life. So I naturally had to go and work out what is the quality of that importance. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Professor Henny de Toy, I think it is, who works on the Global Value Survey uh, here at Stellenbosch, actually wrote about this. Um, he explains the importance of the role of religion uh, in this way. The report notes 
that while trust in political institutions and public institutions recedes, in contrast, civil society organizations, including religious organizations, enjoy the greatest level of trust amongst South Africans. So religion in general, he goes on to say, and churches in particular, play an important role in the political uh, socialization of South Africans. So in this sense, from the overview of the statistics and what was presented in that research, we can say at least two things. First, South Africa remains a nation in which religious language and religious imagery plays an important role. Secondly, that South Africans place a great deal of trust and confidence in their religious convictions, their religious leaders, and in faith communities, since these are amongst the most trusted institutions in society. And the church clearly has a significant role as a social institution that bears a great deal of respect among South Africans. So, for this particular reason, uh, the concept of forgiveness was chosen. I go into that in some detail in my, in my research, discussing uh, some of the, the current social imaginary around the language, particularly um, after the TRC, uh, the notion of forgiveness was mainstreamed in public political discourse. Whether you agree with it or not, uh, it became a very important term. So let's move on to uh, the next section, the politics of forgiveness and social identity complexity, that should say, in South Africa. Now what the research found was that South Africans hold very different views on the concepts and processes of forgiveness uh, from this particular study. Uh, my colleague Robert Fossler, uh, writing about forgiveness, said the following about the unfinished business of forgiveness in South Africa. He says, forgiveness and related concepts regarding engagement with the past continue to be influential but highly contested in public discourse. And I think this is true for Christian communities as well. Um, together with uh, my colleague uh, Melika Fouri and Dr. Wilhelm Favut, uh, for the past three days we've been uh, doing a series of talks at one of the largest churches in our area, a church I think that has about 6,000 members, but I think it's almost entirely white. And we often find that in faith communities uh, there is a very, very strong homogenous uh, racial, cultural and even class identity that gets entrenched. So it's, it's a significant problem. Uh, not only in society, but also in churches. And so this was uh, the, the problem that I was given by uh, the two ministers of the two Methodist churches in Somerset West, uh, the Reverend Jean Murcott and the Reverend Yvette Moses, who said, how can we help our two communities uh, to find one another? So the first thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to give some logic, some structure, some content to the manner in which their theological convictions might be related to the other aspects of their primary identity. So, um, I used this particular model, which was uh, the model that I developed uh, in, in my uh, first uh, doctoral research, which was done just before the New Testament was written. That's how long ago it was. Um, it's, it's wonderful when you do something very long ago and you find it still has a little bit of use. <laughs> but this particular uh, model of identity is a sort of complexity model uh, of identity, an integral model, um, which relies on the fact that uh, any person who makes meaning, constructs meaning of any concept, uh, will always rely on four aspects of their experience and their reality. And often what we find, particularly in academic studies, is that we tend to collapse our studies into one of the four quadrants. So let me just quickly talk you through them. Uh, if we look on the left-hand side, we have the two interior quadrants, and on the right-hand side, we have the exterior aspects of life. And then if we look at the top and the bottom, the top deals with the individual, and the bottom with the collective. So uh, the top left corner, the upper left, deals with issues of faith, belief, spirituality. This is often where Christianity, uh, theology, psychology tends to operate. The bottom one uh, is sociology, aspects of theology. Uh, so this has to do with our collective identity, things like culture, uh, even maleness, femaleness, whiteness, these aspects come in here. What is there about our identity 
that we receive in an intersubjective manner from one another. The top right uh, are those aspects of our identity with which others can see objectively, aspects of our individual identity. Uh, whether you are tall or short is, a, is, is an idea for it. It's, it's not a moral problem. But people can turn it into a problem. And the same comes with issues like whiteness uh, or blackness. Uh, people can turn it into a, a problem. The bottom right hand one uh, tends to do with collective exterior things, uh, such as where you are born. The fact that you are born in South Africa in 1963 and not in Chicago has a massive impact uh, on your social identity. So what we did is we worked with these groups and we asked them after reading this particular text, Matthew chapter 15, uh, chapter 18 verses 15 to 35, you can go and read it if you'd like to. Um, we, we asked them to describe for us what does forgiveness mean and what might it mean to forgive the members of the other community. And uh, the research found this. So we did this for a number of weeks, but this is what the research found. The black Christian community tended to articulate notions of forgiveness in a social and a political manner. So the content of, of what they shared uh, in, in their groups was that forgiveness would only be a reality if the conditions for forgiveness were experienced. So basically they were saying, uh, we're not willing to go for cheap forgiveness. We're not willing to go for forgiveness as a spiritual concept. Uh, we want to see the fruits of forgiveness in our society. We want to live, first of all, in reconciled communities, the bottom left. We want to see that we are truly able to reconcile with white sisters and brothers and have nothing to hold against them. But we also want to see that that is attached to the material reality in which we live. And so they called for uh, economic, social and political transformation. And these are some of the things uh, which I think we need to highlight in our uh, churches and religious communities as well. Interestingly enough, in terms of predominantly uh, westernized white social identity in South Africa, we found a very similar thing, that social identity constructs tended to shape hermeneutic principles. Uh, the predominantly white uh, middle class community tended to individualize and spiritualize forgiveness. So, uh, just to explain that to you, um, one of the members said, and I quote, apartheid was wrong, but it's over. I confess my part in it, and I believe God has forgiven me. So you can see, there's an individual understanding of forgiveness. The sin of apartheid that is committed is primary, primarily a, a sin that has spiritual consequences. And so the offended party is not the neighbor. It's not the person with whom we live. The offended party, the one who holds the sin against me, is God. And so all that is required to restore uh, harmony is to receive God's forgiveness. Now it's not difficult to see how persons who hold these very different views of the politics of forgiveness, because both of these are political positions, they situate the person in relation to the rest of society. It's not difficult to see how these may come into, contact, uh, into conflict with one another. Okay, the good news is we are moving towards the end. Okay, when I preach in my church, this is normally when people start saying, thank you, Lord. Okay, so uh, we're almost at the end. So part of the, the, the uh, um, goodness, now I can't even think of the word in English or Afrikaans. Part of the task that I was given, the, uh, the project that was given to me by these two ministers, was to figure out what might be possible so that these two communities could find one another. That was a, an intended part uh, of the study. And what the research showed was that what we needed to do, because people's hermeneutic views, because their construction of uh, their beliefs was so culturally informed, that we needed to try and facilitate instances in which positive intercultural engagement could take place. And so the theory that was used uh, in the constructing of these intercultural biblical uh, groups is intergroup contact theory. Uh, so many of you, I'm sure, know about this theory. Um, Alport and Hugh Stone, we have here at uh, Stellenbosch, Hermann Swart, who's done a lot of uh, really great work. I know Professor Gaborda Marike Zella and her team do a lot of work on this. But basically what intergroup contact theory suggests is that very often we hold on to our views, our in-group views, um, and we do so 
in, in relation to, to outgroup views. And if our view of the outgroup is one that is relatively positive, or we are not threatened by them, we are willing to engage their views, or at least what we, how we perceive their views. But if there is a measure of intergroup contact anxiety, and this is something which is very, very prevalent in South Africa, uh, a lack of understanding of the other, we tend not even to encounter the other, but only our prejudice of the other. And what often happens in those situations is uh, that people become entrenched in their theological views. They begin to say that the views of the other are wrong and my views are correct. So uh, what we did in our groups, I'm just giving you the, the two minute version of this, was we facilitated these group meetings in such a way that a number of conditions uh, were present. And these were things like equal status, uh, working together towards a common task, the need for cooperation with the other uh, to complete the task, and permission from authorities, so the church saying, we are literally uh, asking you to engage in this task of working with our sisters and brothers to find forgiveness. And we found that under the carefully facilitated conditions of positive intergroup contact, because mere contact is not enough, it has to be positively facilitated. Under the conditions of positive intergroup contact, we were able to lessen intergroup contact anxiety, as the story at the beginning uh, shows. Where there is space to differ and the opportunity to encounter the other, other in safety, um, intergroup contact anxiety was lessened. And what happened as a result of that, and this is the area in which uh, Melika has worked particularly, is that empathy became possible. So, as we heard in the story right at the beginning, the first kind of empathy that seems to operate in those situations is what's known as affective empathy. The moment the one person could begin to, s to see you're a parent and you have children and feel about them in the same way that I as a parent feel about them, they were humanized. And that affective empathy, the emotional connection, allows for cognitive empathy. If I can understand how you feel, I might be willing to consider that I understand how you think. So, uh, I'm going to end uh, just in a moment. Uh, the one thing that I do want to say about the research is that uh, the, the findings of this particular research project are not normative. We work with a very, very uh, contained uh, it was a case study. We worked only with two communities and further research will come out of this, we hope, in which we can expand the population group. Uh, we also recognized that uh, the study itself had some very clear objectives. But for the problem owner, uh, the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, Helderberg Circuit, the question was, does this mean that uh, forgiveness is impossible? And I think from this we can say that even though the discourse of forgiveness in South Africa is highly contested and often used in very, very problematic ways, it's not impossible. Certainly from a theological perspective, my commitment to the continued engagement with this term uh, is very strong. Um, I often uh, say in my classes uh, that and this is now where we're getting seriously theological, but if we believe in eschatology, if we believe that there will come a day when injustice ends, I always say to my students, think of that day. You know the day I'm talking about. The day we read about in Revelation 21, where there will be no more hatred, no more death, no more crime. If you think about that day, and you think about South Africa in that day, our only choice at the moment, our ethical choice, is to ask ourselves, where we will position ourselves in relation to that reality. And in my conception of the eschaton, forgiveness is important. So I end with this quote uh, from Martha Nussbaum, who says, The ability to imagine the experience of another, a capacity almost all human beings possess in some form, needs to be greatly enhanced and refined if we are to have any hope of sustaining decent institutions across the many divisions that any modern society contains. And in my estimation, that also includes the church. Thank you.